chemistry up through into organic and some biochemistry. Um, aside from these roles, I'm involved in a number of organizations that are science-based that range anywhere from chemistry, water, as well as cancer. So we'll probably get the chance to talk about that a little bit later. All right, awesome. We're glad to have you all with us today. Um, today, we're actually gonna talk about involvement in STEM, um, you know, by the African-American community. And um, the first question, now this is how it's gonna be. I'll ask questions and then we have conversations around them. And then we will also entertain questions from the viewers and the students. Um, the first question I have here is, how did you hear about your career major and what made you interested in that STEM field? I'll start with Dr. Noble. Okay, mine's is such a long story. Um, where my mom worked, he was a pediatrician and that has been my pediatrician since I got to college. <laughs> so then I had to go to the big girl doctor, but um, that's what made me want to become a pediatrician. Um, I would say my fourth grade year in elementary, we had those white cards that we had to fill out. So of course, everybody wanted to be an astronaut, a scientist, and a pediatrician. Um, at that time, I didn't find the importance of learning multiplication or just the general spelling of things. But it was the fact that she read through the cards and I knew that she had gotten to mine and that I spelled the word pediatrician wrong. And also in the fact that she knew I didn't learn my timetables and made me put my hands under the desk. So it was just um, being put in a spot and not knowing that kind of pushed me um, to be the way that I am now. So um, when I was a kid, um, before 610 was made, of course you had to pass by Xavier. And I did not know what the school was, but I saw the green roof and I just knew that I had to go there. And I attended um, two summer programs there. And it was just, you know, being in the environment that pushed me to um, become what I am now. Um, my interests lie in math, physics, chemistry, and biology. Um, because I had to work so hard in physics, that kind of deterred me from physics. Um, but I do have a passion in math which led me to the role of chemistry and to become a scientist as well as an instructor. Awesome, Chuck. You really had an interesting journey. Yeah. Um, I guess you were introduced by it by your, you saw someone who was actually in the STEM major, a scientist, and that inspired you to go into that field. All right, Dr. Tabika, how did you, you know, hear about your major and um, what made you interested in that field? So the question, um, ask what made us interested in our career major. And that's, yeah. for me, that's a two-pronged approach because my career major and my major in undergrad were two different things. So um, if we talk about, you know, the major I had in undergrad, my story was very similar to Dr. Noble. Um, I did have a seventh grade teacher who um, introduced us to the process and the scientific method. Um, had never heard of the scientific method before then, but it was a process and I was intrigued by it. Through that lesson, we did a brief experiment. It was so funny because almost everybody on this call probably have done this, where we looked at an onion cell under a microscope. Literally, when you take an onion, chop it in half and pull apart the layers, you have that very thin layer, you die and you look at it in the microscope. That was the experiment that led me to pursue a career, a degree in science, because, you know, I pulled that layer of cell apart so well, and my teacher was so proud that ingrained and instilled in me that I could do science, that it's possible. It's not a foreign abstract thing, that science is something that's attainable, and I could be successful in it. So that happened in the seventh grade. Um, so chemistry um, was something I was naturally drawn to. I am a fan of math. I am a fan of logic and process. So naturally I graduated towards chemistry. I enrolled at Xavier University for my undergrad. And in my senior year, we had a class section on cancer biology. Um, I thought I was gonna be bored to tears because that class up until that point was a bunch of regurgitation, 
Mm -hmm. um, nothing really interested. Remember, biology was not my thing, um, mm -hmm. but it was something about that lesson. And it was something about the concept of what happens um, in the cancer transformation process. Learning about signal transduction pathways was absolutely fascinating. Um, so from that one section in one class, I knew that that's something I wanted to be involved with for the rest of my life. Um, I was poised to go to graduate school, no, to go to medical school. Um, I was a chemistry pre-med major, but it was that natural science pull that led me to go to graduate school and pursue a PhD in molecular and cellular biology. Awesome, awesome. I think we almost share something com in common, like my dad is a civil engineer. And um, I have uncles who did engineering and one of them is a medical doctor. So I was opportune to see how, you know, what it, what it means to be an engineer, what it means to be a doctor. And I'm an African and back home in Nigeria, I mean, it's a prestigious thing to actually follow one of the professional courses. As a matter of fact, you're either an engineer, a doctor or something or a disgrace to the family. That's how it is back home, <laughs> you know, because when we go to school, our parents always push us. It doesn't matter what you can do or what you were born with. It always, you gotta be a doctor and engineer, you know? So I had that, you know, um, example, you know, to always look up to. And that inspired me because I always wanted to be like my dad, you know, be a supervisor in the field. I'm into pre drawings as a civil and construction engineer. And that was what made me, you know, go into engineering as uh, one of my majors. So now what are some different disciplines within the STEM field and their basic core requirements? Because um, I feel not a lot has been, you know, shared on what you can actually be as a STEM major student, you know, beyond being a doctor, beyond being an engineer, beyond being, you know, the very common professions. There are so many other things, like you could be a botanist, you could be a dentist, you could be a zoologist, you know. So what are some fields, especially in Delgado, that um, students who are winning or who are interested in enrolling in Delgado or in any institution could actually apply for within the STEM field? Dr. DeBlessing. Um, okay. So in terms of STEM, um, STEM is very, very broad. And we can really talk about STEM crossing multiple disciplines. Um, it, it's not all science. Um, in, in terms of you know, studying a core science and doing something different. For example, I'm thinking specifically of people who write and edit scientific magazines. So you are a writer, but you write STEM-related content. So um, in terms of different fields, um, science is typically broken down into your um, physical sciences and your biological sciences. So physical sciences include chemistry. Um, Dr. Noble and I both have a background in chemistry, um, physics, geology, things that deal with the earth and the soil, um, biological sciences, anything dealing with a body, whether it's plants, animals, things that live and breathe. Technology fields that has truly expanded um, over the course of the last, I want to say, 30, 40 years, because while it's computers and computer-based, if you think of technology at its core, but there's technology in each and every discipline that exists. So when we talk about chemistry and chemical technology, it's technology behind chemistry and the tools that we use in chemistry that is indeed computer-based. Um, engineering, the age-old profession of engineering and structural and building, um, there are tons of different engineering fields. Um, even biomedical engineering. So the, the field there is, is, is vast and, and mathematics is just what it is. <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> um, I don't know if Dr. Noble had more to add there. Yeah, Dr. Noble, please. <clears throat> yeah, so Dr. Duplessis hits on a lot of great things. Um, keep in mind that when we talk about STEM, that that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So especially statistics, in terms of math, of course, engineering, aerospace, SLT, and just to highlight Delgado and some of the great things that we're doing in the science and math department, as we have been labeled number one in providing education to the students, um, our physics department, they recently got a grant, the NASA Collaborative Opportunities. They were awarded this grant and it creates a response team. And like Dr. Duplessis said, for writing. So it doesn't matter your background because we do need people to write. Um, planning and submitting solicitations to aid NASA in the, um, I believe it was the um, 
Artemis mission, um, where we actually do have a very competitive and robust team. I believe we beat LSU, not in football, but <laughs> <laughs> with our, um, our physics team, we have the, um, the LACES program in which they deal with basic electronic sensor interfacing, mechanic design. Um, they've gone multiple times to do the uh, scientific ballooning in Texas. And then of course we have our SLT program, our science laboratory technology program. We did a welcome for the students on yesterday. This is biotechnology as well as chemical technology. Um, we are making partnerships and relationships within the community so that we can get more of our STEM majors out in the field. And then of course, the, um, we have the water and wastewater program, which is how I met um, the guy that I hooked you up with for engineering. So, and yeah. you can also, you know, mention your meeting with him and, you know, how that's helped out as well. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. Most definitely. I mean, it appears to me that there are a lot of opportunities for students to excel, especially at Delgado. I never knew we had all the scholarships and grants. I want to go to NASA. Man. We have to make that work. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I actually, we were supposed to have this um, event last week, Friday, but we had to push it to today. And I spoke to Dr. Noble after, you know, the prep discussion. And she was able, I communicated my aspirations, you know, and in terms of my career field and career path. And she had someone in mind that could help me achieve that. That's something spectacular and amazing about Delgado. I mean, if you ask the right questions, there is always a solution to everything you need. Like my journey right here in Delgado for everything I need, I reach out to anyone. There's always someone who knows how to help me. And I think that's what every student should actually, I mean, there is, the sky really is the starting point in Delgado if you actually are willing to get the best out of it. So this moves me to my third question. Um, we know there are a lot of people who are intimidated by anything involving math and calculations. and are there still options of getting into the STEM major fields without an excellent attitude and love for math? I've spoken to a lot of students and especially I'm not trying to be biased, but girls, you know, once it's math, they're like, uh, uh, you know, I just want to do something easy. And I, so, I mean, if you don't have an aptitude, a natural aptitude for math, and to some people it comes natural, for someone like me, I had to study. It wasn't really natural for me. I had to put in the hours. So could you still strive and succeed in, or find a major that suits you if you're not really, you know, an excellent math student? Absolutely. And I'm one of them. Okay. Oh. So in, in terms of mathematics, math was never my strong suit. It was something I always had to work at. Um, but if you have a not don't give up attitude um, and be patient with yourself as it relates to mathematics, mathematics is a skill. And like most skills, you become better at it the more you do it and the more you practice. Um, afraid of math um, is, is just something that comes with time. I will tell you that anybody can do math if they're willing to put in the time, energy, and effort. So no, I was not an excellent math student. I still ended up as a chemistry major. Um, my mind was in biology. I did have specific math course I had to take. However, um, it wasn't my song student. If anybody out there who isn't necessarily the greatest math student and still have a desire to go into science, that love and desire for science will propel you through that math course because it, it's a skill that is the undercurrent of a lot of science majors However, it is not the one defining factor when thinking about a major or career choice. Awesome, awesome. Dr. Noble? I would say for me, um, I'm kind of like one of those special kids. I went to math and science, which I am in my biology lab, <laughs> uh, my high school biology lab. Um, we took courses here at Delgado Community College, um, not with the college, but utilizing um, the second floor. And so the college professor that, not college professor, high school teacher that I had, he's a graduate of MIT. So I did math Monday through Saturday. Um, we would go to the coffee shop. It was PJ's at the time on Carrollton. And we would work through that algebra. We would work through the calculus. Um, and he gave incentive. If you made 100 on your regular test, he would give you $50. 
if you made 100 on the final exam, you got $100. So that was our motivation. Um, and I think that really pushed a lot of us um, to be great students in terms of math. Um, to highlight one of our HBCUs, uh, Xavier University, Dr. Barrett, he spoke in DC and um, he just talked about if we are able to create the opportunities for those people who lack those skills or you know just don't have those skills, we have to at least try to provide the opportunity. Um, one thing that we talked about in terms of the SLT program is to kind of sharpen up those skills doing certificates. And Delgado does offer a lot of those adult ed education type courses. So, you know, I think for those that are lacking in skills, we have those remedial courses to help, but we have to make sure that we're building these students up, that we're at least providing some type of mentorship opportunity so that they can see that it's not difficult at all to attain. Awesome, yeah, because I feel um, with most students, like I had that feeling, the fear of even attempting, you know, math isn't that monster. It's just like everything in life. If there's always a way around it, if you're consistent, if you put in the work, you know, you would succeed and excel in it. So although math is like a basic requirement because everything in science requires the basics, addition, subtraction, you know, so you need to excel or have an, you know, a basic understanding of how that works. And that leads me to my next question. What basic skill set is needed to get into and succeed in the STEM fields? Dr. Noble? I would say um, everything that we've highlighted, math, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of go through that. We do math all the time when we write things. When we write things from top to bottom, we know that we're about to add or subtract. We do it in a checkbook. You know, we do it when we're trying to calculate how much money and amount of gas we're going to get. If we go to the food aisle, pounds and dollars, we do that all the time. And we know that if we're going left to right, we're going to either multiply or divide. So we see it all the time. And as a mentor, we have to just tie in everyday skills, life skills, to um, encourage the students. Um, also what we talked about in one of the previous questions and what Dr. Duplessis has stated, being able to write. Um, I hate writing, but I'm good at it. Um, it's just that I have to get all of my thoughts down, you know, and it takes a little bit longer. It's not like a um, chemistry or a math or a physics where I'm swifter on my feet, you know, but Again, I'm good at it, but I'm lazy, you know, so we have to kind of get out of those habits as well. Um, critical thinking, problem solving. Um, we choose not to put it with our classes, but if there was traffic, we find a way to go around that traffic and get to wherever we're going to get to, you know. So again, just tying those everyday skills into those key areas. Um, so math, um, writing critical thinking, problem solving. Um, Dr. Duplessis, anything else? I think you pretty much nailed it. Um, what I wanted to highlight is problem solving skills. Um, we may think we're not problem solvers, but we are. We do it all the time. It's just applying problem solving to your particular subject area. I think critical thinking is key. Um, the ability to deduce and, and, and retain information is another one. Um, but also, you know, when we think about skills required to succeed in STEM, we think about being just inquisitive. That's a skill, being able to ask questions and probe and, you know, look at a situation and ask why. And then when you don't get the answer, ask again and ask again and again till you get to the root cause of what's happening. Um, all of those are skills. Um, when we talk about research, both Dr. Noble, myself, and others on this call have done research in the scientific setting. And oftentimes it's redoing and again and again, multiple times over till we arrive at that answer. Um, so being inquisitive is a skill. Asking questions is a skill. Problem solving and critical thinking are the top four for me. 
right? You made mention of something that's really important, you know, inquisitiveness. I remember being an ambassador for the CRCL, the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana. I did a paper um, with them that I started back home in Nigeria as my final year project. And it was like comparative analysis of um, different coarse aggregates made from seashells, gravel, like the periwinkle and all of that. I realized that in coastal regions, you know, we have a lot of waste from, you know, shells and most of all these oysters and all. And mm -hmm. we end up bagging them and putting them somewhere. They, they become, you know, become like, um, they begin to pollute the society or the, the community smells and stuff. So I thought, how could we use this, you know, this waste product to enhance the community? And then as an engineer, I, I realized that we make concrete from aggregates, you know, gravel and stuff. And at the end of the day, sometimes most of the structures we try to build don't require the level of, you know, strength or components we use. So I realized that like, we could actually do some tests on this to see the comparative analysis, the strength which we can get from the strength which the concrete we make from seashells or from gravels and then just making alternatives you know cheaper alternatives that you know could be sustainable by the community and that's something that came from inquisitiveness i just wanted to see how i could help i wanted to see how this energy could be directed you know to something better so with these skills inquisitiveness you know staying at your game trying to know trying to study and putting in the work these are basic requirements that would help you succeed in stem now speaking about your personal journey what are some roadblocks you've experienced in this field you know like i know um i've spoken to some people funding in some hbcus and also what are some roadblocks you've experienced um dr noble Hmm. <laughs> so um, I got my graduate degree from um, the University of New Orleans. Um, when I got there, I'm one of the Katrina kids. So um, that was going into my second year. Um, I was left with deciding if I should get a job or if I should pursue my PhD. Um, I interviewed for a job in Tennessee and I had a heart to heart with the scientist that was interviewing me. And he told me, you know, if I was you, I would continue and I would get my PhD. So I turned the job down and um, I decided to finish. Um, at that time, um, the group that I was in, they were in Canada and then they later moved to Spain. And at that time I could not go with them. Um, so it was the journey of joining three different groups, having to complete a four-year degree in three years. Um, so I really had to hammer it out. Um, not being respected um, as a graduate of an HBCU, um, being discriminated against um, by a professor, um, also dealing with um, your own peers within graduate school, um, them not being as helpful or trying to sabotage. Um, and that kind of hit me hard, but it gave me motivation to keep going forward. Um, so I think some of those issues for some may be a downfall. Um, I had a mentor, I had um, professors there as well as staff that I can rely on. So again, um, we have to make sure we provide those mentorship opportunities. For undergraduate, I am um, an alumni of Xavier University, which is a Catholic HBCU. Um, I had an academic scholarship, a cross country scholarship and a grant, and that paid for my college years at Xavier. So I didn't pay anything. Um, so I think funding is very important because I don't think I would be here if I did not have that funding um, or I wouldn't be as successful because somehow I was just gonna have to make a way and I just don't think I would have been um, successful. So I think for the most part, the lack of support may deter some people who are not strong enough to continue from completing some type of education in the STEM field. Mm, that's an amazing point, Jimmy. What about you, Dr. Duplessis? 
the subject of roadblocks is, is one that cuts very deep when you start to look at individuals with, you know, degrees and titles and jobs. You often see the end product, but the road it took to get there, you don't see that. Um, so when, when I, I look over my career and the things that I've been um, blessed to be able to do, there was lots of roadblocks along the way. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with, with the most visible um, roadblock that you see is myself. Um, you know, as, as students in, embark in the field of study, there's a lot of self-doubt. Um, so being able to overcome um, confidence issues, being able to overcome, you know, situations where you're the only one that looked like you. Um, I've been in many situations where not only was I the only female, um, I was often the only African-American, both African-American and female. Uh -huh. um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that, um, I folks received my PhD at a very young age. So often, in addition to being only, the Afri only African-American female, I was often the youngest in the room. So when we talk about roadblocks, um, sometimes we are that roadblock. And despite what you may think in terms of, you know, the level of confidence and assertiveness, sometimes that does weigh on your ability to be successful. Um, I want to uh, mention something that Dr. Noble Brooks talked about mentorship. Right. And in having a, a team and a tribe around you to help and support you and keep you going and keep encouraging, surrounding yourself by people with like minds, mm -hmm. um, people who support you and your initiatives are extremely, extremely important. Right. Um, funding. Um, we talked about funding a lot. Funding is the key. Um, education is expensive. Um, and that's just a harsh reality to it. When I was um, a sophomore, and I'm also an alumni of Xavier University, someone said, um, when we were in an MCAT training session, that it takes money to make money. Right. And I didn't understand that when I first heard that concept, but um, after that session, I, I really, really thought about that concept. So I was a pre-med major and we were preparing for the MCAT, but the MCAT in and of itself is expensive. And one of the things that prepare you is an MCAT prep course that is expensive. And then the AMCAS application is expensive. So you have to have a certain amount of funding in order to get many times at multiple levels of, of achievement. So, I mean, funding is, is often a um, pillar of success. Um, I went through Xavier as an academic scholarship. I will be the first to tell you I lost that academic scholarship. It was academic based. Um, my sophomore year, I lost that scholarship. Um, I ended up going on a search because I knew I wouldn't be able to contend, um, continue with Xavier without it. I ended up qualifying for another scholarship, but I was a scholarship recipient that lost my academic scholarship. That was a roadblock for me. That killed my confidence as, as a student. Um, I will tell you, I had a strong family support system around me that rallied around me and pushed me forward. I got out there, I searched for scholarships, I applied and I did get one to continue my education at Xavier University. Um, when we start to talk about careers and both Dr. Noble Brooks and myself, we have PhDs. Um, that is a subjective degree. And I don't know that anybody ever talks about that outside of that PhD realm. But when you start to look at master's degrees and I aspire for every one of our students to pursue degrees beyond the associates because that is just a stepping stone to get you to the next level. Mm -hmm. um, we always talk about upward mobility of our students. This is just the beginning of um, your associate's degree, right? There's much more to come, greater will be later, right? But when we talk about a subjective nature of a degree, it's not that you pass your classes um, at the end, you earn your degree. That's not the subjective nature of these terminal degrees at the end. You pass and you finish when a collective of your a committee says you graduate. It is totally subjective. When they conclude that you have done enough work to be a part of their ranks and a colleague of theirs, only then do you graduate. You can pass as many tests as you want. That doesn't mean you get the degree. So when we talk about roadblocks, it's the nature of science and degrees in academia. At a certain level, it is subjective. It is not based on an A or a B on an exam. Is based on whether that collective says, yes, you've done enough work, you've acquired enough knowledge and skill to be my colleague. Welcome to this world of your doctor. Um, the last roadblock, and I don't wanna to spend too much time here, 
is um, having the lack of having real life examples of what I wanted to be, right? So there was a time when I wanted to go to med school and I learned very early on that that was not for me. My plan B was to go to graduate school. So without you know, belaboring the story, I ended up going to graduate school. Mm -hmm. There was almost nobody there that looked like me. There were no students that looked like me. Mm -hmm. I went to Tulane University um, School of Medicine to obtain my degree. And there were not many African-American females at all HD to help guide me and lead me. So, you know, a lack of mentorship in that sense and having a real world example of what I could be when I grew up, that didn't exist. Wow, you really hit the nail by the head. And I'm really grateful we are having this conversation because sometimes people only see the glamour and the glory, but they don't get to see the story behind all of it. I mean, with all of y'all's testimonials, it reminds me of the movie Hidden Figures, you know, what the ladies had to go through. You know, sometimes being an African American, you have to prove yourself twice, you know, to achieve something. And then being an African American lady or woman, that is, it, it just makes it more difficult. But I mean, through all of this, one thing we can take back today is determination. You have to be your own cheerleader sometimes. And then secondly, you also have to connect to the tribe, just like you say, Dr. Duplessis. When I got into Delgado, I knew I needed, even though I had you know, a pathway of what I wanted to do, I had an idea, but I know I needed people to help me make that possible. And I, everyone I talk to, I always you know, tell them my goals, what I want to do, because you just never know who knows someone or who knows how you can make it faster and easier. And speaking to Dr. Noble, and she introduced me to engineer Brian, he sat down with me as a mentor and, okay, this is what you're supposed to do. You know, okay, this is what I expect from you. Every week, send me, you know, what you're doing. He made me accountable to the process, you know? So we all need that tribe, you know, to hold us accountable. And um, I definitely want to get my PhD degrees. I'm so inspired right now by both of you. So hopefully I do get that as well. So how do you advance your career path? I'm sorry to interrupt you, to, not to be off topic, but the movie about the engineer doing the windmills, was that the Nigerian guy? It was on Netflix. Okay, no, no, that was, that was a South um, that was a West African country. Uh, that okay. was a Nigerian, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, we're smart. We're Nigerians, we're smart. <laughs> okay, so how do you advance your career path in the fields? And, you know, I know you, you all have said, you know, mentioned it, and how do you triumph in these spaces? Like, I know we touched base on it, but could you just give some, you know, pinpoints? Like, what are the steps? You made mention from associate degree, what next, what next, you know? Um, I would say from getting that degree, um, making sure that you're not modest. Um, I might be one of the modest <laughs> people ever. When you told me to write about myself, I had my name where I graduated from. I had like four things and that was it. And I'm like, oh my God, like what am I supposed to put in this? Um, but then, you know, my friends, they're like, oh, you got all it is going on, like, you should do this, or even like my promotion packet, they're like, sit down, have a couple seats, and don't do anything else. Um, so don't be modest. Um, insert yourself in different areas. Don't pick one area. Um, my degree is in organic chemistry, but I have research in statistics. Um, I did a um, summer internship in toxicology in Thailand. Um, I did work with the National Dioxin Campaign with the EPA at um, Stennis in Mississippi. Um, I worked with Dr. Morgan at Xavier University um, before I graduated. Um, and it was amazing because even though she's not an African-American, she was a young female graduated from Yale, I believe, university, you know? And so for me, having these prestigious females inspired me to want more. And so, you know, obtaining that PhD and then what else can I do? And then being here at Delgado, um, Dr. Duplessis and I, we've been inspiring each other. Um, she was deciding if she wanted to be on a board for the sewage and water board. She's like, nah, I said, no, go ahead and do it. Like, go ahead, I think you got this, you know? And then um, it was another position. She's like, nah, I don't think. I said, no, yeah, you should do it. You should do it. And she's like, you know what, you should probably. I'm like, I don't know, you know? So um, 
being there to inspire each other. Um, like I talked about the LACES program and the NASA's collaborative program. Um, we have Ms. Rivers in the physics department. She always wants to include us. She's always sending us grant information, you know, so that we can elevate the programs and diversify the programs that we have here. Um, Dr. DuPlessis is getting us involved with the Sewage and Water Board and making us um, all these great connects for water and wastewater. And then just being able to have this program here to service the community, um, to even just better ourselves. Um, I have my certificates in water treatment, water production, uh, wastewater collection. You know, if I get the work experience, I can turn them into licenses, you know. So just not being scared to step up to the plate and, you know, hit the ball, take whatever has to come your way. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Duplessis. I just want to say this before I, I, I answer the questions. I bet you did not know how Dr. Noble and I interacted and, and really support each other in our careers. I, I Honestly, think. yeah, this is, uh, I'm like, I got to be in the loop somewhere. Because, <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So um, the question was, um, how do you advance your career? Um, first and foremost, get experience. You know, when you finish with a degree, um, one thing your employee, potential employers would ask is what experience do you have? And you can begin doing that now. Um, I remember um, when I was an undergrad, I really wanted research experience. Um, it's a long story, so why I, I needed that, but I really needed research experience at the undergraduate level. And um, when I came to that conclusion, and then I'm getting to that in a second, but um, any lab that would have me, I volunteered in. It wasn't for money. It was for me to be able to say I had that experience and to gain those experience. So no matter what, try to get experience in your field while you're doing your studies, be it paid, volunteer, temporary, do what you can to get your foot in the door and gain that experience. Um, take risks. You can advance your career by taking risks. You will not you know, get to the next level if you don't try. You know, so you have to get out there. You have to put yourself out there. You have to take risks. Um, you can advance your career by writing. Write, 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 write. Whether it's a blog or, you know, you're responding to a Facebook post, an Instagram post, a LinkedIn post. Um, all of these things get you exposure and you can begin to establish yourself as a um, leader in your field. Um, peer review publications when you have the ability to. Um, newspapers, it does not matter. You have that in your control. So write, 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 write. Put yourself out there and um, gain experience. I'll quickly tell you the story about experience. So I was a student at Xavier, and we knew that in order to get to the next level and be successful in the PhD world, um, we had to do a summer undergraduate research program somewhere, right? Um, so I applied many places. I ended up getting um, an invitation to interview for a summer internship um, at the National Institutes of Health. Um, one thing we didn't mention, Dr. Noble Brooks and I are both native of New Orleans. So we are both um, children of New Orleans, Louisiana. Oh, and awesome. like other people, I had never really been outside of the South. Um, to Texas, traveled to Mississippi, maybe to Florida here and back, but that was it. I had never even been on an airplane um, until I was a sophomore in college. And I took this trip, I was so excited to interview for a summer program at the National Institutes of Health. And um, it was an amazing experience. It snowed while I was there. That was the first time I had ever seen snow in my life. I'll tell you that my mother bought me a coat because I need, never needed a for real winter coat outside of the city of New Orleans. Um, so here I am in Bethesda, Maryland, interviewing with the National Institutes of Health. It was a panel interview, I was nervous as I could be. And the first question they said was, hello, we reviewed your resume. Everything looks impeccable. We're super impressed, but we didn't see any experience. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your experience in research. Done. I was floored because here I am thinking that I'm here to gain that experience. And they politely told me, no, all of our candidates have prior research experience. And I'm, I'm looking at them like, well, where was I supposed to get that research experience? 
I didn't even know I needed it. I thought this was that opportunity. And they said, nope, we need you to come to us for research experience. Um, so when you talk about how to advance your career, that story literally popped into my mind because that was such a tremendous experience for me. So I would give any up and coming student the advice of get experience while you're in school. It doesn't matter whether it's paid, doesn't matter if it's volunteer. If you wanna be in that field, start volunteering and getting yourself in that field so that you are prepared. And when you walk out of the door of your institution with that degree, you have that experience in hand to arm you um, to be prepared for your next level. Thank you so much. Like this is, I don't know about other students, but I'm really learning so much from this. Like I really needed to have this conversation because um, in the last one month, I've been applying for different opportunities, you know, and I'm going there, even though I do have some experience, but I'm going there to gain more. But from what I've seen from interviews, people really want someone with an experience, you know, to, uh, some level of experience so they can build on it. So it's a necessity. And I always, what I was taught from, um, especially from what you've said is, I always was taught to put your worth with the pay range. So I was always, I always was taught to put the pay somewhere in front of the conversation, but that hasn't helped me so far. So right now, I think I got to re-strategize and see how I can get more experience because with the certification, with everything you know, there has to be some sort of experience to arm that up, you know, to give you a better place. Thank you so much for all you said. So what is the Ogata doing to make our campuses more STEM inclusive? You know, um, I would say that we have now, like um, we've talked about the SLT program, the Science Laboratory Technology Program that includes biotechnology and chemical technology. Biotechnology um, was awarded a grant <laughs> where we can, um, we were awarded, I believe it was $25,000 worth of equipment. Um, and this equipment is similar to the same equipment that they will use in their career fields. Um, so we're doing a lot of cell culture, tissue culture, um, forensic, um, and other areas in terms of biotechnology. Um, with chemical technology, we have multiple instruments. We have an HPLC, we have an atomic absorption spectrum, we have a GC so that we can um, get the students trained and into their career fields. Um, we've gotten multiple students into various careers from oil, um, like working with Dow or Exxon, um, Intertech, some of the chemical uh, companies that are in the area. So again, building those relationships um, with those particular companies and partnerships. Um, we have with the physics department, the NASA collaborative um, program that I talked about, um, that particular grant, and also the LACES program um, that they run. Um, I believe we started a robotics area um, at the Sydney Collier location. We have a new science building um, at the West Bank location. We're renovating um, building one um, to make it more, um, which would say STEM related in terms of that biology lab are those biology labs over there. So we are constantly updating and improving and diversifying our program so that it can represent what we have in the area. And basically we wanna lead um, to personal growth um, where with this experience, the students can um, look like America, look like the community, you know, and that's what Delgado represents. Um, we have one of our instructors, Dr. Zalea, um, who's Hispanic um, in terms of his background, but I believe his father was a student at Delgado Community College, you know, coming, not knowing how to speak English um, appropriately or whatever. So again, just look like America, look like the community. Um, we're providing those opportunities, we're upscaling those opportunities, and we kind of want to give those people without previous experience an opportunity, you know, to get that experience. Um, of course, improving our recruitment and our retention is key, but again, we have you know, the SLT program, we have our physics program doing great things. Um, one thing I didn't mention is our geology program. They're doing great things as well. So we're just constantly um, 
getting everything updated and diversifying based on the need of the community. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I had a couple things um, in terms of what is Delgado doing. Um, we're creating new programs. Um, so we talk about science laboratory technology. We're talking about chemical technology, bi biotechnology, water and wastewater technology. All of these are relatively new programs. You know, Delgado is 100 years old. These programs have only been in existence the last five, maybe six years at the most. So, you know, we're, we're doing a lot in terms of programming. There's a lot. If you have any um, other science uh, instructors on, on the call, we're doing a lot. Mm -hmm. We're doing a lot to um, bring in new programming. So we're always looking for new programming, always looking for new directions to take our programs. Um, Delgado has begun to amass an amazing team of scientists. Um, when I was a part of the chemistry department, I will tell you, we have more PhD teaching staffs than some of the four-year partners. And, and that was something to be proud of. I still tout that fact when we talk about how great Delgado is, and you see that in our ranking of number one in science programs. So we have a great team of faculty present to help not only teach the courses, but guide students in those career paths. Um, we are looking for ways to partner across the college. So doing things that um, different departments can work together. We do have a fab lab. The fab lab works well with the, the ballooning stuff that's happening in, in science and math, but we also partner with CAD and architecture. So partnering in departments across the college is something that we do well. Um, we provide resources to our students. You know, you have the, what is it, the science research lab and the math lab to support students who are actually taking um, programs making business connections and um, partnerships around the city, around the region, around the state, to not only be able to provide additional support to our students, but also to put Delgado Community College on the map as being you know, number one in science and being a great supporter of students that are looking to not only advance their career and their degree, but you know, support the industries as well um, and staying current. I can't say that enough about um, the faculty that are in the science and math department. Um, they stay current, they, they, you know, they read journals, articles, they're always bringing new information back to the classroom. So Delgado is actively involved in making the campuses more STEM included um, and, and promoting programs across the United States, to be completely honest. Uh, that's really impressive. Like we've done so much, the institution has done so much. I, I wish a lot of students, you know, really know about this. It's a prestigious thing to be part of Delgado. So one of the questions we um, got up here is within the technology field, who can I contact to find interim jobs? Um, in terms of internships, um, always start with your division deans. Um, okay. They have a lot of information about um, their partners, their contacts. Um, that's a great place to start, but we also have career services that receive this information as well. So uh, please visit the SINSET department and you can um, inquire there. They can get you connected and set up on um, what internship that you may qualify for or be interested in. Awesome. we got one other question. What's the best medical school to attend in Louisiana? Um, LSU <laughs> has gotten rave reviews. They're cheap. Um, Tulane is good. But even some of the doctors who've graduated and worked at Tulane, they give LSU a high rank. Um, they deal with your gunshot wounds and everything else. They deal with the real deal over there. So like I said, they've been spoken highly of by everybody. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so thank you for taking out your time to um, actually do this with us. I'm still looking out for more questions. We have roughly about probably three to five more minutes. But um, from everything we've said today, I believe that um, two things. First of all, it's dependent on the person. You have to be willing to learn. You have to be inquisitive. You have to be um, you know, determined. A comment here was, these stories break my heart, but your strength and resilience gives me so much hope. Thank you so much. And I wish you the best of everything. I mean, personally, this is beyond like, you know, a panel discussion because I'm learning so much. I'm gleaning from all you have said. And it's actually going to be a strong path, you know, help me create a stronger career path, you know, to get in, in, in the line. So what are some advice you would give like to students who are actually thinking of starting or who are in, but, you know, are going through roadblocks and feel like quitting? 
like what are some last words you give to students? I'll begin with you, Dr. Noble. Um, of course, you see that I'm in the lab. Um, I'm currently working with a um, chemical technology student that's going to be graduating in May. Um, and just not having confidence, it was, oh my God, like, I don't think I'm gonna do well. And I'm like, we just started, you don't know that. Um, and she's like, no, I know. And I was like, no, wait a minute, let's get this together. You can do anything that you put your mind to. Um, having her, um, her peer, because it was two in the class at that time, having her peer here to stop, calm down, I got you, and help and give advice and to encourage and me also feeding in to um, nurture. And then that has turned into so much. Um, there was an opportunity at Dow and she's like, you know what, I'm gonna apply for it. And I was like, wait, what? And she's like, yeah, I said, you know what? And that's what I want you to do. And she did, she's been doing an amazing job hammering out everything. Um, so we just have to pour all the love and support and knowledge that we have from our prior um, opportunities that we've done and our roadblocks that we've encountered. And we just have to, you know, speak life into our students so that they know that they have support mm -hmm. for <laughs> for well from you know Delgado Community College because you know that's our role at the end of the day. Awesome. Dr. DePlessis. So um my biggest piece of advice to any student that is embarking on any you know academic path is to be patient with yourself. The road is not easy. It will not be easy. Um if that's the case and everybody would have PhDs and doctor degrees, right? Um, be patient with yourself. You can learn, you can achieve, you can be successful. There is no limit. The limit is, is in our own head and it's our own mind. Yes, you will be faced with obstacles, but if you be patient, you be persistent, you can achieve anything you desire. Um, I think that was the biggest lesson I had to learn um, when undergoing my academic pursuits. Um, just be patient. Be patient with yourself. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, we've had an amazing time with Dr. DePlessis and of course, um, Dr. Noble. Uh, I'd also love to thank the interpreters from the Lighthouse and every student who joined. I believe that the path, the road to success is narrow. You don't have a crowd there. And that's why we only have one Elon Musk, one Jeff Bezos in the world of 7 billion people. So for people who are interested in succeeding in the STEM fields, now, why is my passion in STEM? I mean, you can't even compare the salary to pay, you know, from STEM majors and some other professions. So if you're looking forward to better yourself, to be better, to better your community, I think, and you have an app for science, you have an app to know more, I think the STEM field is for you. So with all that that has been said today, I hope we've learned so much. This video would be available at the student government um, page. So you could always refer to it because there are so many gems that were said here today. I will go back to rewatch it myself. And you can, how do we stay in touch with um, both of you, Dr. DuPlessis and Dr. Noble, like if the students need guidance and you know need to speak to you, what ways could they contact you? So um, I am a, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. My office is located in Building 2, um, Room 208 West. Um, you can reach me via email at tdule at dcc.edu. Thank you so much, Dr. Noble. I can be reached at a-n-o-b as in boy, l-e, at dcc.edu. I also wanted to um, share some videos, but I don't remember where I put them at, but um, they're from, here it is. It's Achievements of Black Chemists. Um, it's through the ACS, which is the American Chemical Society. Um, one of the professors that um, is highlighted is Dr. Warner an African-American male from um, LSU. I believe he was the head of the department. Is that right, Dr. DuPlessis? Um, I can put, let's see what I got here. 
I'm going to put this link okay. into the chat for everyone. And then from there, I believe you can go ahead and click to get to um, like the different videos and stuff on there. And um, like when I talked to you the prior week, this just popped in my um, my inbox from the American Chemical Society. Um, and I thought it would be a good fit. Um, we also have Novache as well to highlight that um, since it's Black History Month. Um, it's a, a Black national organization for chemists and chemical engineers. That may be something you may be interested in yourself um, to join. Um, we have Dr. Margot Montgomery from, she's at Xavier University. Um, I think she has some type of leadership role with um, Nobache now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So big shout out to our advisor, Ms. Amy Trainer. She was the one who referred the panelists. And I'm really so grateful that I contacted them and they, with all gracefulness, decided to be part of this. Um, without further ado, we've had a great time. Thank you to every student who participated. I think I had Michelle Brown um, pop in at some point. I want to thank everyone. Byron, I want to thank the representatives from Lighthouse. And um, we've really had an amazing time today. So if you want to get this video, we'll upload it before the week runs out at, at the SGA um, site. Um, and you can actually always refer to the video. And please do if you need guidance, if you need counseling, whatever you have, we have Dr. Noble and Dr. Duplessis all to help us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Do have a fantastic day.